Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Genealogy Gems podcast, episode number 280. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Whether you want to visit the village where your ancestor was born on your next vacation, or you just want to find some of their records, you're going to need to know exactly the place name and the location. Professional genealogist Rich Venezia is here to help us pin down those ancestral places. Welcome to the show, Rich. Thanks so much, Lisa. I'm really glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Really happy to have you here. Uh, This is such an important topic. We've got to know where people came from to be able to track them down. You know, I was just reading your article. Uh, It's called Hometown Heroes in Family Tree Magazine. And in it, you said something really interesting right off the bat, which was you said that um, near enough isn't good enough. What are you trying to help people understand when you say that? Yeah, so when we start with our research, we're often starting with censuses, especially, right? Those are often kind of the the backbone of a lot of American research. And so if people are moving around a lot, or if you aren't exactly sure where they lived because of the decennial census, you might be able to track them around and say, well, you know, they were living in California and then you could figure out, well, they were first in Los Angeles and then they went to San Francisco or whatever. But a lot of other countries, especially Western and Eastern European nations, don't have similar types of these censuses, or at least not that are available to us. And so if we only know you know, let's say the state where they're from or the province or region in a different country, it's often really difficult to figure out um, where the records are because a lot of times the records are going to be held at a really local level. And so unless you know that exact town or village, more often than not, you're going to have a lot of difficulty um, getting any records and, and, and moving your research further back in the old country because you really need to pinpoint that exact location. That's a great point. And I I know sometimes uh, I've seen it where I see a record and it says Warsaw, but they weren't really in Warsaw. They were just really close by. Is that fairly common? Yeah, precisely. My, my parents actually, um, I got to tell them, you know, the exact Italian villages where their grandparents were all from because they always th- said Naples, right? Or they heard Naples as part of their family story, but none of them are from Naples. They're all from, you know, 45 minutes, hour, hour and a half outside of Naples. <laughs> but I think that that happens uh, pretty frequently in the type of research that we're doing. And even today, you know, when you meet people around the world or across the country, they'll probably won't often say the suburb of, you know, New York or Philly or DC where they're from. They'll usually just say, you know, the city that's close by. So I think that kind of pervades to today. And it's a great way to, uh, you know, remember when you, when you see big cities listed on a death record or something like that, you might need to dig a little further uh, to ascertain whether it was indeed that city or if it's someplace that's close by. Awesome. Well, In the article, you give 16 sources that we can turn to to try to pin this all down. Uh, Let's start with number one, which I think is excellent, which is Ship Manifest. Yeah. So Ship Manifests are a great way to start when we're looking for our ancestors that came over voluntarily, that were interested in finding a better life for their family. The problem with manifests is that they weren't really used to regulate immigrants because of the laws in the United States until around the late 1800s. And so because of that, there's not always great detail on them. So if you're like me and you have a lot of 20th century immigrant ancestors, manifests can often give you most all of the information that you need. But if you're researching earlier ancestors, uh, you might very well never find a manifest because there wasn't one created or the manifest is only going to give you a country of origin as opposed to any place more specific. Great. And so let's say that they they immigrated, you found it, you realize, oh, it doesn't have that specific. Number two, you mentioned naturalization records. I love these. And I just think they're an amazing resource. Tell folks about uh, what these are and, and what they might have for us. Sure. So naturalization records are often kind of the, the next stepping stone when we're researching immigrant ancestors. They relate to the process to become a U.S. citizen, um, which was never a requirement. So you may find them for your immigrant ancestors, but you may not. 
Again, starting in the 20th century, we see really helpful information on these records. We generally get exact places of birth, place of last residence, which certainly isn't always the same, information on ship of arrival, lots of great details. But because of kind of the lack of regulation of, of these or lack of federalization of these records, the forms weren't standardized prior to the early 1900s. And as such, again, we run into this situation where every now and again, you'll find a record from the 1850s that's super helpful and gives an exact place of origin and lots of other great genealogical details. But most pre-1906 naturalization records aren't generally going to give you that exact location of origin that you really need to, to go across the pond. Sounds like we have to do a lot of collecting of all the different ones. You never know which one's going to have it. Exactly. I, I know for me, for my great-grandparents, that was the only document that mentioned this little village of cotton. You know, everything else was much more generic and kind of yeah. the general area, but that was the one. So you never know. Right. Uh, number three was vital records. Now that makes sense What birth, marriage, and death, right? Right. Of course. So... These are a great way to, again, collect a lot of documentation and see maybe where if you've got 10 or 15 or 20 to order, only one or two of them might have the, the precise information that you're looking for. But, you know, if you're researching a family that came over at different times, if you've got, you know, uncles and aunts and cousins, you want to get all of those records because it might only wind up being, you know, your the the last nephew's death record or something that lists the place of origin of his parents, right? And it sounds crazy, but I've seen it before where you gather together all of this documentation and if there's 30 possible records to get, it's the last one that has what you need, but that makes it really important not to skip out on, right? Not to miss because it could be the only thing that mentions it, especially sometimes for, for earlier immigrants. Um, sometimes we're talking further back, and I see that number four is marriage licenses and, and marriage records, which typically somewhat older than some of the other available vital records, correct? Yeah, and so of course, you know, sometimes I, I do very little, I will say I do very little colonial research, but I do know there's often uh, colonial marriage bonds that people might be able to find um, but also in a lot of places, like in Pennsylvania, where I live, for instance, the marriage licenses in the county start in 1885, but the birth and deaths for the state don't start until 1906. So you do often find that marriage records or marriage licenses might wind up predating some of the vital records. And in some cases, like for New York City, for instance, uh, you often or you may have the opportunity to get two or more different records related to the same event, right? There might have been an application for a marriage license and then a marriage license or a marriage certificate or a marriage return. And a lot of times they're not necessarily filed together. So you might need to go digging around and looking to see if there are other records. For instance, in New York City, they have a, a second uh, set of, of marriage records, they have marriage licenses that people had to fill out prior to getting their marriage, get, getting married, right, to getting their marriage certificate. And so between, I think it's 1908 and 1937, there's the secondary document that you definitely have to get because it asks for birthplace, but also asks for parents' birthplace. And that information is not listed on the certificate. So if you just stop at the certificate, you might be missing some great additional information. Hmm. Reading between the lines, I'm really hearing you saying we've got to really, in a sense, research the jurisdiction to know what did they have, what did they um, create, what kind of records, in what process, because that There's, varies well, a lot yeah, by county, nice by word. state. In uh, Here in Pennsylvania, we started marriage uh, record keeping in the counties in 1885. And actually, for the first six years, there was a second copy that went to the state so if you happen to have people married in this small time frame, you've got a county record that's at the county, the county record that was sent to the state, which should be identical, but might not be. There's also the potential for the religious record, right? Um, and if in some places they had city marriage returns as well. So there might be a possibility to find three or four or even five different records that all document the same event. But because the records were kept by different people for different reasons, there might be 
a lot more information on some than on others. Everyone has the possibility. I love it. <laughs> okay. And, I, and then you just, you just touched on the church records because uh, we have the vital records we think of at the county courthouse, but then there's the church records and those can go much older too, right? Right. Absolutely. And that's uh, especially for folks researching ancestors who were Catholic. The Catholics were and are notorious record keepers, and they're often very interested in figuring out or noting down, you know, where the parties had been baptized to make sure that people getting married were Catholic or the people that were baptizing their children were Catholic. But of course, we've also got great records that go quite far back, like the Quakers. Uh, the, you know, there's the Friends records, which have uh, many of which have been digitized by, by Ancestry. Um, and of course, there are other religions that have their own records, many of which may have not yet been digitized, but would, which could certainly include the same type of information about origin or place of last residence, uh, place of baptism, something like that. So it's it's always a good idea, and and often uh, vital to to make sure to look for those types of uh, of records as well. Excellent. Well, number six. We go a new direction. We're going towards military records, World War One and World War Two draft registrations. This might be new to some people. Tell us about this. Sure. So um, these are records that are generally relatively easily findable on the big websites, Ancestry Family Search, Find My Past, etc. And oftentimes they did ask for a place of birth. And so most immigrants who were here in the early to mid 1900s that were born sometime from about the mid 1870s forward should end up in these records. Doesn't mean that they served in the military, but if they were a man of draft age, they would have needed to fill one of these out. And so again, we run into this issue of the more recent, the usually the, the, the yeah. more records are available. But in this case, it's great because you're not just looking for people that wound up becoming citizens. You're not just looking for people that may, you know, have been Catholic or whatever, or show up in, in religious records. You know, all men that would have been between these certain ages on these dates would or should have filled out these records. And so these records may indeed specify that exact location of origin. Yes. One of the most comprehensive collections. I mean, it really does cover everybody, which is terrific. We'll be right back after this. Today's episode is sponsored by newspapers.com. And this is your go-to resource for unlocking the stories of your ancestors. Dive into the newspapers where your family's history unfolds as you search nearly a billion records in seconds. Newspapers.com offers an unparalleled treasure trove of historical newspapers, providing really a window into the past. With papers from the 17th century all the way to today, Newspapers.com is the largest newspaper archive. It's really a gold mine for anyone seeking to uncover stories from the past. I use it all the time. Whether you're a seasoned genealogist or you're just starting your journey, newspapers.com makes it really easy to search for obituaries, birth announcements, and the everyday stories that shaped your family. It's really like having a time machine at your fingertips. And here's the best part. Our listeners get an exclusive offer. So use promo code GENEALOGYGEMS for a 20% discount on your subscription. That's genealogy gems all together, no spaces at newspapers.com. Sign up today at newspapers.com with genealogy gems and embark on a journey of discovery. Today's podcast is brought to you by Archives, your trusted resource for researching your family history. Archives is a vast repository of historical records offering a seamless journey through your family's past. Imagine discovering long-lost relatives, exploring genealogical documents, and tracing the roots that define your story. Archives makes research quick and easy with an intuitive approach to genealogy. They keep their search tools simple, but behind the scenes, their extensive record collections are paired with powerful technology to deliver valuable results. 
archives is an invaluable resource if you want to make your family history research simple and affordable. Just visit archives.com and let your family history journey begin. That's archives.com. Number seven, you have military service and pension records. Yeah, so these are one of kind of the first ports of call that I would want to look into for an earlier immigrant ancestor. We have pension records back to the Revolutionary War um, and they move forward. So War of 1812, which of course was the big Preserve the Pensions project a few years ago and um, up to the Civil War and even a bit later, Spanish-American War. So folks whose immigrant ancestors served in the military, even if they came over, you know, 250 years ago, their pension records or their military service records could be really helpful. A lot of times there's things like affidavits that say, you know, my name is John Smith, but I was born on this date in this place, or even it might even just say the county, you know, in Ireland, for instance, or England, but even still, that's obviously much more helpful than just Ireland or England. Um, there's sometimes things like copies of uh, family Bible records or marriage records, because you have to remember that when we're talking about pension records, we're oftentimes talking about you know, other people that would have been affected. So if they died in the war or shortly thereafter, their widow or their minor children could have been eligible for this pension. And so of course they would need to prove the relationship. So if the marriage occurred back in the old country, or something like that, there might be copies of these records, affidavits, some type of testimony that provides that, which could all lead us to clues about that immigrant's origins. Yes, a record collection that could lead to, could actually be encompassing many different kinds of records. Yeah. We love that. Now, number eight might be a little bit more rare, but gosh, if it exists, it'd be well worth going after. You have employment records. Yeah, so employment records are one of those one of those record sets that is definitely uh, for a bit more advanced research. You def you first need to figure out where your ancestor worked, but also a lot of times you need to do a lot of digging to determine where the records are if they even exist, right? Uh, a lot of times we're talking in archives, you've got to, you know, get boots on the ground, you've got to get your, you know, your hands dirty with old records. But there are some really excellent employment records, some of which are, um, you know, have been digitized, but we're talking very few of these records have, have been put online. You know, some, some railroad records have been uh, popular, and, and so some of those have been put on some of the big websites. But a lot of times, you know, we got to figure out, okay, where was the you know, the company headquartered, you know, was it headquartered a different place now than it was a hundred years ago? Where in between might these records be? And also what type of records might exist? So there are some great repositories, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, the Heinz History Center in Pittsburgh, for instance, has a great uh, selection of employment records for Pittsburgh-based companies, Alcoa, Heinz, um, Westinghouse. So if your ancestor, you know, happened to go to one of these places where these records have now been put in an archives, they're obviously much more accessible than if the archive still remains with the company. A lot of times that may be much more difficult uh, to get your hands on. But, you know, if there are things like applications for employment or even just information about employees, there could be, um, you know, there could be information about place of origin. There might be newspaper, um, there might be periodicals. A lot of companies did newsletters. And so there might also be things about, you know, somebody that passed away, which could list information um, or, you know, new hires, for instance. And so there's all sorts of, of possibilities, but this is definitely not the, you uh, type it in, you search it and, and you find it easily. This is uh, <laughs> often hard one hard won victories, but they can be some really great, really interesting uh, records. And oftentimes, well, sometimes may include a photograph as well, which can be really special. Uh, I agree with you. It's They do pose more of a challenge. They're kind of a good back pocket item when nothing else is panning out. And I have to say, yeah. uh, I had 
a grandfather and a great grandfather who worked for the railroad. And I was amazed to see the records available through the Atlanta National Archives. I mean, um, it was well worth it. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. Well, silly me, I forgot to ask Rich about item number nine. <laughs> and that record group is Social Security Applications. Now, in his article, he says, quote, Social Security began in the mid 1930s, and most everyone who was alive and eligible applied throughout the following decades. Social Security applications known as the SS 5S ask for both a place of birth, albeit often just a country of birth, and parents' names. The SS 5s are available for a fee through a Freedom of Information Act request to the Social Security Administration. www.ssa dot gov slash FOIA slash request. We'll have that link in our show notes. And that makes this the perfect time to remind you that the show notes are available at my website. And you will find the link for that on YouTube in the video description below the video. You can search for social security applications at ancestry.com as well. I'll have our affiliate link to ancestry in our show notes as well. And when you use our links, that helps support this free show. Thank you so much. Now, back to my interview with Rich Venezia. So we have number 10 is alien registrations. Um, I haven't done much research in this area. Tell us about this. Yeah, so alien registrations weren't really very regulated until kind of the latter part of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s. And so prior to that point, there were only a handful of times where there might be some instances of alien registration. Um, but we do see some during the Alien and Sedition Acts shortly after uh, the country was formed, you know, in the late 1700s. Um, unfortunately, most of the alien registrations from that time frame were destroyed. But um, there was a period of time where if you were naturalizing, you had to provide a copy of that alien registration. So there is a 12 year period in the 1800s where naturalization records will contain a copy of an alien registration and it can contain great information about exact location, when they arrived, uh, all the members of the family, the minor children, what have you. And that's just not what we often find on these early naturalization records. Um, so there are some instances where earlier there are some alien registrations available. And then once we get to the 20th century, of course, we have many more available. During World War I and World War II, there were enemy aliens uh, who had to register. There was a nationwide alien registration in 1940. There's a couple of statewide alien registrations in uh, Maine, Minnesota, and North Carolina. So those records are also available. But the alien registrations are a bit more difficult to, to research in and wrap your head around because it really depends upon the location of where they were living. Was there some type of alien registration happening at that time? Um, so the only really comprehensive one in terms of alien registrations would be the one that occurred right at the, well, right before World War II in 1940 and continued on to 1944. Um, so if you do have ancestors that were 19th or 20th century immigrants, if they're an alien on the 1940 census, there's a really good indicator that they should have an alien registration form. Uh, those are currently only available through the USCIS genealogy program. And it's quite a hefty fee. The hope is that eventually they'll make their way to the National Archives. We don't know uh, when that will happen. But I have heard some instances where, you know, folks who immigrated in the 1860s, 1870s that were you know, old men, but had never naturalized, this 1940 alien registration form is the only American document that tells a location of origin. So it's it's really important and might very well be worth the, the money to, to make that request, um, you know, if they, if you would expect them to show up in those records based upon, you know, their alien status in 1940. And if you've exhausted a lot of the other possibilities of places uh, to look for their place of origin. Uh, number 11, one of my favorites, and I think probably one that I've had a lot of success with, perhaps you have as well, county histories. And thankfully, those are much more readily available than alien yes. registrations. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> well, and the great thing about county histories, too, um, as you well know, you know, there was this big push at the centenary of the country to document uh, the histories of the counties and the United States and the people who lived in them, right? And so we will often, again, see much earlier 
immigrant ancestors in these books, even people that had had long since been deceased because, you know, their children or grandchildren were noting how they were, you know, the founders of the county or what have you. And it will often provide, you know, if it's giving a, a, a mini biography of an immigrant, uh, whether it's someone who's alive or has is since deceased, it will often say, you know, where or at least what part of, you know, their uh, country of origin they came from. And so those can be really helpful in providing some of those details, as well as information about, you know, how long they've lived in the county, what they did, you know, their how they got to, you know, Atchison County, Kansas, up the Missouri River and whatever. You know, there's sometimes some really interesting stories in there and sometimes some photos as well. So county histories are definitely a, a great option for folks whose immigrant ancestors were more, um, you know, 18th and 19th century arrivals as opposed to more recent arrivals. Yeah, and that leads right into number 12, which is newspapers. And as I hear you talk about the stories we read in County Histories, a newspaper would be a great place to go and kind of look for another um, take on that story, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and of course, you know, I think we originally think, okay, obituaries might list a place of origin. But of course, there's all sorts of other things that might be listed if people you know, were named as the executor in the will of their parents or sibling that was left, you know, back overseas, that might be listed in the paper because there might have been some requirement about, you know, a legal notice about that. Or steamship arrivals specifying, you know, so-and-so are coming to join Mr. and Mrs. Smith of this city, right? Um, and they might even specify, you know, where they're coming from more precisely than just, you know, they arrived on this steamship. So there's a lot of great opportunities in newspapers and of course more and more are getting digitized There's great digital newspaper repositories both countrywide but also a lot of states have their own digital newspapers projects um and you know there's some outside the box possibilities as well like ethnic newspapers like religious newspapers um, or company newspapers or periodicals like we were talking about with the employment records earlier so you know, there isn't, it's not just newspapers.com or genealogy bank, right? There's all sorts of other places that you might be able to find some really interesting newspaper articles about your, your ancestors, whether they tell you place of origin or not, you know, they the newspapers were, were great gossip rags back in the day, right? So you can find some really interesting <laughs> yeah. uh, stuff in there about who's fighting with who or, you know, who's playing at the the church baseball game that weekend or whatever. There's all sorts of fun stuff uh, that can be found in there. Yeah, I, I've even seen articles where they're talking about uh, folks gathering, I think it was at a Catholic church, and they were saying uh, they all knew each other back in County Mayo, you know, or something ah, where there was a connection, you know, and they were. Precisely. it wasn't the point of the article, but they mentioned it. Right. Well, and you yeah. never know where those types of little things are going to come up, right? And so... Mm -hmm. Newspapers, I mean, I just can't over, overstate, overstate. I can't overstate their importance, right? They're, yeah. they're just, they can, they can have so much utility. And, you know, as more time goes on, more and more are being digitized. So, you know, if you were on the big newspaper websites, you don't find something now, look again in six months, look again in 18 months, because there's just so many uh, resources that, that are being added. And, and so many small towns, you know, had their own little weekly newspaper or whatever. And, and those are really where you want to go if your ancestors live somewhere rural or, or you know, in a, in a small town. That's where you're going to find the really interesting articles and also the articles that might be more detailed, which could give you things like place of origin or other, you know, genealogical details that you're missing. Yeah, that is excellent advice about going back and revisiting. In fact, some of the websites even now have a way to alert yourself. They'll, they'll message you if they upload something that matches something you searched in the past. So that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. I keep finding new things that weren't there two years ago. Um, okay. So we've, gosh, we've covered so many great resources and we've got four here left that I think all, oh, you know, you never know which one's going to be the gold mine, cemetery records, uh, tombstones. We think of tombstones as the first place to look. I'll often find, especially Irish immigrants, love to, you know, their, their descendants mm -hmm. love to place on the tombstones where their families were from. But there could be other records as well in the cemetery 
Uh, they might be dusty books in the basement. You might have to ask real nicely or bring some chocolate or send a check to get access to them. <laughs> um, but you know, you never know what type of information you're going to find in there. And even if it doesn't give you the exact location of origin, it might be helpful to help you determine family relationships, right? And of course, if you now have more people to research and you know that they're all related now, maybe some records that relate to the other people that are in the plot give you the type of information that you're looking for. Um, so of course we wanna start with tombstones, but there could certainly be records at the office. Sometimes records have been digitized. Check with the local genealogical or historical society, see if maybe there's a manuscript that they went around 50 or 75 years ago and and you know wrote down all the information that was on the tombstones then and maybe some of those tombstones are no longer still around so you know the 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 grave stone itself is the place to start but we could be talking about a ton of other records that might possibly be available for your cemetery of interest as well great point so many different options there Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. MyHeritage has developed powerful genealogy tools to enrich your family tree and take your research to the next level. Receive automatic matches to family trees of fellow MyHeritage users and historical records, which provide new details that you can add to your tree. Explore 12 billion historical records to uncover fascinating new insights about your ancestors. Add new information to your family tree in one click. Check your tree for inaccuracies, colorize your black and white photos, and connect with relatives around the globe. MyHeritage makes it all possible and puts the discoveries at your fingertips. I've been colorizing some of my own personal family photos, and not only are they beautiful, but in many of the photos, it's actually been revealing more detail so I can see more of my family history. Growing your family tree is easier than ever before with MyHeritage. The discoveries are out there and waiting to be made. Visit MyHeritage.com and try it today. That's MyHeritage.com. Probate files. We would turn to our court records, right? Yeah, so... so a lot of the earlier probate files pre-1900s for most counties in the United States have been digitized. They're on you know, all the places you'd expect. Uh, they're relatively well indexed. And when we think about probate files, it, it often isn't going to say, you know, this person born in this place, you know, died on this day, right? But there might be perhaps land that they had a share of back in the old country. Or uh, it could be that, uh, you know, along the way, maybe they came from Europe through Canada and they had some property in Canada, which could be a helpful piece of information for you to have. And of course, it also might be that if, uh, you know, they were a single person or had no family, it could be that the people that needed to be notified were back in the old country, right? So you sometimes will find, you know, copies of correspondence sent through the consulate back in the old country, notifying the brother that they needed to, you know, provide X information or that they had a share in this estate and, and, and how is it going to be handled and what would you want to do with it? And so, you know, both in U.S. consular records that you find at the National Archives at College Park, but also in probate files that I've just seen in different county courthouses, you'll sometimes see these affidavits in other languages or, or noting uh, you know, siblings or other people that needed to somehow be involved in the process. Now, of course, that's not gonna be many or even, uh, you know, even a lot of these files, but you never know. So you definitely wanna look. And this is again, where we employ the fan principle, where if it's one of five brothers, you got to look at all the siblings, right? Because you know, if there's five places to look, it's going to be in the last place that you look. Uh, and if you stop, you know, because it's expensive to order the copies or it's annoying to do the research, well, you might be missing out on, on that elusive piece of information that you're really hoping to find. Yeah, that's the good news about a location is, is that oftentimes siblings, they may not all share the same birth date, 
but they might share all the same birth location. So right. it gives us more people to work on. Uh, 15 is fraternal organization records. And uh, there's a lot of different fraternal organizations, aren't there? Yeah, th this is... Oftentimes you'll find these types of records in archives. Very few of these have made their way online. You know, there's a couple of really good resources available on Ancestry, for instance, they've got the Massachusetts Catholic Order of, uh, uh, the Massachusetts Masons, excuse me. Um, they've got uh, the Order of Sons of Italy and America for a couple of different states, though not all of the states. And there's a handful of other ones that have made their way online, but a lot of these types of records we're gonna be again looking for in regional archives and regional repositories. The Historical Society of Pennsylvania has tons of these types of records from all over the country, not just from Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm lucky enough that it's just around the corner for me, so I can I can go hop over and do some research there anytime. Uh, but that's because they subsumed the collections of the Balch Institute for Ethnic Studies, which was at Temple University. And so they have all of these types of ethnic, ethnic related, ethnic fraternal organization records um, that had been housed at the Balch. Uh, prior to, uh, I, I, I don't know if it folded or what the, what the funding ran out or what have you, but anyway, those, those records made their way over to HSP. And so there's a couple of different archives like this around the country. There's also the Immigrant History Research Center and Archive at the University of Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. They've got tons of fraternal organizational records from all over the country. Um, so this is again, not, beginner research, not necessarily easy research. You first got to figure out, you know, was your ancestor a member of, of an organization, look, obituaries, things like that, to see, or again, newspaper articles that specify, you know, they were inducted as the secretary or what have you. And then you got to figure out, all right, they were a member of this organization. Are there records? If so, where are the records? And are the records for the different lodges in, in different places? They're not often centralized. <laughs> and so you might need to, to do quite a bit of calling around to figure that out. But again, especially if it's an ethnic fraternal organization, as opposed to just a kind of, you know, odd fellows or, or, or masons or something like that, the ethnic fraternal organizations, a lot of times the documents are in the language of origin or in both that language and English. They'll ask for exact place of birth in Italy, in Norway, in Poland. Um, so some, some, some great records that you might be able to find, but it's definitely not as easy as typing a name into a search box and, and, and seeing, you know, you definitely have to do some digging first, see if they were a member, figure that out and then kind of follow the breadcrumbs uh, to see if those if those records might exist and if there might be one for your person. Well, you've been leading us through some of the low hanging fruit, some of the, <laughs> the tougher fruit to get. So many of them kind of dovetail into each other and help us Absolutely. lead, you know, lead us through a path from one record to the next until we get to the one that has it. And this all leads us to your final item here in your article. And it is number 16, which is neighbors. And I don't think you're talking about I need to go next door, right? <laughs> I mean, you never know. Maybe maybe your neighbors you could be know. helpful too. Maybe they're also a genealogist, right? <laughs> um, maybe they're a long lost cousin, who knows? Uh, but, well, funny story is, uh, it turns out a few years ago before I became a genealogist, I wound up working with a distant cousin of mine and she was my desk neighbor. So it could be, it could be that, uh, <laughs> that your neighbor is what you need. Uh, but no, what I'm talking about is the fact that most uh, since the beginning of the country, America has been um, has been populated by chain migration, right? So one individual comes from a small town or village, they write back home, their brother comes, then their parents come, then the cousins come, then other people from the village come. And, you know, it's been that way since the 1600s and, and, and it continues to be that way today, right? And because of the need for uh, community, but also people that speak your language, um, the ability to you know, find a job more easily, what have you, you'll find people that are coming from the same village, living in the same neighborhood, or oftentimes in the same apartment building, right? And so if you are researching your family and you have looked at all the documents and you've done all the things and you can't figure it out, but they're living at an address 
my Italian grandpa's uh, at 500 Adam Street in Hoboken. And everybody that lived at 500 Adam Street in Hoboken was from the same village, or at least from the same area, because they knew each other back home. And when they came to the US, they lived in the same place that allowed them to get jobs more easily, uh, connect with employment opportunities, connect with uh, religious organizations. Um, and so you also want to look at, you know, who are the people that they're living with? Who are the people in their apartment block? Who are the people that live next door? Um, who are the people that are witnessing their deeds, that are the uh, ex executing their wills? Uh, who are the witnesses to their marriage? All these kinds of things could be really helpful. And of course, that that increases the, t the amount of research you have to do a hundredfold. But if what you're really looking for is to figure out exact location of origin in the old country, and especially if we're talking earlier immigrants, it, it, it was the same in the 1920s as it was in the, in the 1780s, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you definitely want to branch out and research uh, the folks that they that your immigrant ancestors surrounded themselves with, whether it's physical neighbors or people that continually show up on their documents as informants, as witnesses, um, as co-signers, as, as bond guarantors, all of those kinds of things, because those people uh, could very well have come from the same place. And then you gotta start over again, doing all the, <laughs> all the research for those folks, <laughs> but hopefully eventually it will lead you uh, to the information that you're seeking. Well, and just looking at a census record, gosh, don't we see that? Italy, 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 Italy. And they're all in apartments. Then we just grab your article and we run them through these 16 yeah. record sources again and see if we can't at least find an origin for them, which then would at least give us a clue of a place to look. These are all yeah. terrific ideas. And I really recommend that everybody um, get the Family Train Magazine, it's September, October, 2022 issue. Check out the home tier, Hometown Heroes article by Rich Venezia because it is kind of like your checklist to run through. And um, whether it's easy or hard, it's worth it. And it was so worth it to have you here on the show. Thank you so yeah, much, Rich, you, for helping us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. I always appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you and and to write for Family Tree Magazine. So I'm uh, I, I'm glad for the article. I hope that y'all get some good ideas from from listening to having listened to this this interview and also from reading the article. And I, I wish you the best of luck in in uh, figuring out where your folks were from and maybe eventually getting to go visit as well. Oh yes, that would be even better, wouldn't it? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for this Genealogy Gems podcast episode. Again, to get the show notes for this episode, head to genealogygems.com. In the menu under the free podcast, uh, you'll see a list starting with the most recent episode. Click on the link for number 280. And there you will find the show notes page with all the details, all the links to things we talked about. And for you premium members, you're going to be able to download that PDF cheat sheet. If you are not a Genealogy Gems Premium member yet, then I would suggest go check that out. Uh, head to our website. You'll find a red button on the homepage or go under Premium in the menu, and uh, you can become a member. It lasts all year long, and it gives you access to hundreds of videos, podcast episodes that are exclusively available for Premium members, as well as the downloadable cheat sheet for all of our content. So our free episodes, our free videos, they as well have these downloadable PDF cheat sheets, and those are exclusive for premium members. So we'd love to have you join us. And finally, stay in touch with us by clicking the red button on the homepage for the newsletter. That's absolutely free. You get a downloadable uh, bonus PDF when you first sign up for that. And it's a great way for us all to stay in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And uh, let me know what you'd like to hear on the show or comments that you have about the show. And on each of the show notes page, we also have a comment section. That's a great place to share your ideas and your feedback on what you're hearing here at Genealogy Gems. Thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>